So I will be uh, talking this afternoon about the subject of um, hyperglobalization and uh, the first question I guess is what is hyperglobalization? I use the term to suggest a couple of things. Um, one is that uh, there are different types of globalization. Globalization isn't just one thing and it depends a lot on how we design the rules. Um, and I use the term hyperglobalization uh, to describe um, a, a model of globalization um, that uh, we push towards increasingly after the uh, 1990s. So I think before 1990s we had a much more uh, limited kind of globalization where trade agreements uh, tended to um, concern themselves just with um, barriers at the border, import tariffs, non-tariff barriers, Financial globalization was limited because countries still had control over their of, over their capital account and, and capital accounts were managed. Um, uh, and then after the 1990s, really with the creation of the WTO and then our headlong drive into financial globalization, we moved into this kind of a world where uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's more of a hyper-globalized world. Um, and um, I suggest in my uh, presentation that uh, this has created a lot of tensions, um, tensions between the winners and the losers, uh, the, between uh, groups who are able to set the agenda, multinational corporations, investors, financial institutions, and uh, groups that feel um, that they're uh, excluded, um, that their ties and are, are, they're much more local and communitarian rather than global um, and that in some ways that this is uh, responsible for uh, the kind of backlash uh, that we have been experiencing in, 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 um, in, in the last uh, few years. Um, so I talk a bit about um, the relationship between different types of globalization and, and populism. Um, I also make a distinction between different types of populism, that I think populism is particularly harmful uh, when it corrodes or erodes uh, norms of liberal democracy um, represented by uh, independent judiciary separation of powers uh, and independent and free media. Um, uh, and that's really the most damaging aspect of populism. Um, uh, but uh, there are also uh, po policies that might be called um, examples of economic populism. And economic populism sometimes uh, tries to uh, correct um, the, um, the, the playing field between labor and capital, between popular groups and, and corporations. Um, and, and often I think capitalism has needed a kind of a correction uh, of that kind. Um, historically in the United States the New Deal um, of the 1930s was an example of that. Uh, the creation of the welfare state in Europe uh, was another example in the European context. So I think we might be um, due for another such correction and I think many of the kind of economic reforms that we are going to be, um, that we need uh, are um, of what might be cons called perhaps of an economic populist kind in the sense that they are redistributive policies, they are policies that are um, uh, um, trying to redress the playing field and, 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 and limiting the influence of big banks, big banks or big corporations. Um, and uh, that somewhat paradoxically in fact, and this is my main conclusion at the end, uh, that certain kinds of economic populism might be our best defense uh, um, against the really harmful political kind of populism.